Welcome to episode three, where we will be learning everything we need to know to make plucked sounds for MPE in Surge XT. And to do that, we're going to be working a lot with envelopes, which we haven't talked about much in the first two episodes. So we're going to be talking about the, uh, all the various ways that Surge lets you use and shape envelopes and some of the special considerations for using envelopes with MPE. So let's get down to it. Uh, first, let's load up our initial patch. Again, we built this in episode one. If you don't have it, you can open the zip file linked in the description and find ThoughtForm MPE in it. And you can use that. Um, there are a couple things we're gonna do really quickly to have a sound we can listen to while we explore all our options. First, let's go over to our filter cutoff over here. Right click on that and delete this timbre curve from the modulations. Now, you might actually want to save a copy of your init patch right now. I found that the first thing I do every time I open this patch is delete that modulation that we just deleted. So maybe you can save yourself that step in the future. Next thing to do is the quick envelope shaping. I'll explain why we're doing this later. But let's go over to our filter EG and our amp EG. These are our envelopes. Now let's just turn down the sustain all the way on both of them. The S is for sustain. Now let's go over to our oscillator. Our init patch is very brassy sounding. I want to work with something more stringy sounding because you're more likely to pluck strings than you are to pluck trumpets. So let's set this oscillator up the way we did for the cello in episode two. Let's go to the classic square wave, grab the width, put it around 20%, width two around 20%, and then go down here to our timbre curve, double click it so that we can edit the modulation, and just drag the width two up back to around 50%. Now, because we're doing a plucked sound and not a continuous sound, we're going to handle our oscillator volume a little differently. So let's come over here to our mixer and get the volume for oscillator one. And let's just delete this pressure curve. So instead, we're going to use velocity. But first, we need to make ourselves a velocity curve. In episode one, we go over the process of setting up one of these curves and tailoring it to your hands. So after we get the basic curve shape, you just want to play around with it for a while and adjust it until it feels comfortable to play and you don't have to press too hard or strike too hard in this case, because we'll be using velocity. And let's actually, let's go over to pressure curve, right click and copy it and paste it into LFO3. Rename this velocity curve. And with this, we're going to take the phase, delete the modulate, oh, oh careful. <laughs> velocity curve has to be selected. It was still on pressure curve. Okay, we're gonna take the phase and it has no modulations. So we'll, we will add a modulation from MIDI velocity. 99%. Now, because we copied the pressure curve, everything else should be set up for us. So we can just adjust this curve. Uh, we have to set this up as a modulator before we can hear it. So just a second. Click on velocity curve again until it turns to green. Let's pull this volume modulation up all the way. And now we should be getting some sound. Very quiet. Let's drag up the, uh, the minimum sound. Now we already have a sort of pluck because we, of what we did to these envelopes, dragging down the sustain. So let's go back and modify our velocity curve. Now this is something you're, you're going to want to spend time on, and I'm not going to take the time to do it in this video, but again, get it so it sounds comfortable. 
I do want to show this though because I want to suggest a curve shape. I've been playing with this recently. Curve shape something like this. And the nice thing about this curve is it lets you play very evenly in the, uh, in the moderate pressure range, moderate velocity range in this case, although you can also use this shape for pressure. Uh, allows you to play evenly over here, and you still have access by striking very softly to the very soft notes or to the very loud notes by striking hard. So this is a shape you can play with. Let me turn up my cutoff a little bit because we're very quiet. Okay, our sound is set up and we can move on and start talking about the envelopes. So Surge gives you two envelopes by default. They're over here. You have your filter EG and your amp EG. Now each of these can be thought of as an automated knob. So the amp EG is going to turn up your volume for you during the attack stage. That's the A in the ADSR. It's going to turn your volume down for you in the decay stage. It's going to hold the volume at the level you set with your sustain, which is the S. And then once again, it's going to turn the knob down for you during the release stage. And the filter envelope will do the same thing, except it instead of a volume knob, it's controlling this uh, cutoff slider. And you can set the amount by which it controls the cutoff slider with these two sliders over here. This is the amount of filter envelope. So you can have a full effect by going all the way up and down will give you a full reverse effect. So it would be turning it down where it would be turning it up. So that's kind of cool that it has its uses. Actually, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put that up. We'll have our full, we'll use both envelopes from the start. If you set either of these filter envelopes to zero, then they're just not going to do anything. And your cutoff will remain where you put it or where you modulate it with some other input. But this filter EG will just have no effect when we have these set to zero. The amp EG, on the other hand, cannot be bypassed because the way it works is it turns your volume knob down and if it's not doing anything then you will have full volume all the time which is not exactly musical so we can't turn it off but we can find a neutral setting for the amp eg where it's not really affecting our sound very much and that's what we've used in previous videos and that's how it came in when we opened it up today so the neutral setting has the sustain all the way up, which means that the decay doesn't matter because it's going to be dropping from a volume of one to a volume of one. Now the attack you can leave all the way down and it will be neutral. Now theoretically the neutral position for release would be infinite, but our computers aren't going to like that. So I will just set it at the middle and turn it up if our sound is getting cut off at the end. Let me turn down, neutralize this filter EG also, turn that to zero. And so now we have the volume of our sound is being controlled by our velocity curve, but it's not changing over time. Now this is often how we want things to be set up for MPE because we want to be, we want the player to be in control of those dynamics of the sound. However, MPE was not designed to make the player's life harder. So we don't want to be adding unnecessary complications to what the player has to do. So if we were to use pressure to modulate volume as we normally do, then the player would be required to strike his instrument very fast and then slowly release pressure until the note was finished. And he would have to do that for every note. 
Whereas in real life, someone playing guitar just plucks the string and physics does the rest. So we're going to let our envelopes stand in for physics here. Now in most acoustic instruments that are plucked, they would actually have zero sustain. What the sustain is in, in our physics model, that's performing the function of an external energy source that is continually feeding into the instrument. So that would be a bow in a bowed string instrument. It would be your breath for a brass or a woodwind. Uh, it would be bellows on an organ. Something that delivers a continuous stream of energy to the physical system. And plucked instruments usually don't have that. And we're just going to focus on the plucks today for the most part. So let's turn the sustain all the way down so we can start with a natural plucky sound. And let's turn up this filter envelope effect a bit. It's a little short, so I'm going to bring up our decay length. Let's, uh, let's add one more modulation. Let's use the velocity curve to modulate this filter amount a bit. And then let's bring it down some. Now, most of the time, we're going to be able to do everything we want to do with just these two envelopes. But I want to show you your other options for envelopes in Surge. So let's go down to our trusty LFOs. And we look down here at our various different shapes. This one here is the ADSR. So now we have a third envelope. It's flat right now, we can see, because it has the sustain all the way up. So it's not going to do any reduction to the volume or whatever parameter we decide to modulate with this, because these are not hardwired to anything. We have to set up the modulation. Uh, but if we turn the sustain down, you can see we have a bit of a shape there. If we turn the attack up, turn the release down. That's weird. I'll set this to be unipolar. I usually want envelopes to be unipolar. And if we have this running on key trigger, this will act just like either of these and modulate whatever you want it to. This LFO EG does have a couple extra letters here. We have another D and we have an H. So the D is a delay. You can see what it's doing. It's going to make it wait before it starts your sound. And it might be hard to think of a good use for that. But say you wanted like a double pluck on something. You could modulate it once with the amp EG and then modulate it again with the LFO EG and get yourself a little double pluck. And then the H is a hold. And hold is how long it's going to stay at the maximum volume once it end, reaches the end of the attack stage. And that might be useful if you're if you want a little more of that peak. But we're not going to use this one today. So let's go to LFO5. And we'll pick the shape over here. This is the MSEG envelope. This is the one that we've used to make our pressure curve and timbre curve and all that. And you see it starts off in an envelope-y kind of shape. And what's really handy about this one is it's a visual aid. We can see it much bigger than we can see those other ones. So here we have our attack stage. Here we have our decay. Here's the sustain. You'll see this is gray here. It's because this area is being looped. So it will continue to play at this level for as long as you're holding the note once you've passed the attack and decay stages. And that's set up in this loop, loop mode down here. See, if I turn this off, as we usually do for the curves, um, then it's not going to do that looping. If I turn it on, it is. 
And if I set it to gate, then it will use this release stage. If I just have it on, as you can see down here, it's just going to stop suddenly, I guess, when you release the note. So we want this set to gate. And we want it to be unipolar. And so apart from being a good visual aid, what the MSCG envelope lets us do is get greater control over the curvature of our different stages, which does make a big difference in your sound. If I come back to the tiny display that you can't see, on the filter EG and the amp EG, we have digital and analog modes. And the digital is just a straight line. So digital mode would look like this. And the analog's got some curvature to it. And I think the analog sounds more natural, but you can also adjust these things with the digital envelope. So if I go to these areas here that are lit up, I can roughly change the shape of these things. And in doing that, I could get the same thing as the analog envelope if I wanted to. Most of the time, I don't need that much control, and I just use analog because I like the sound better. So I'm going to set both of these to analog now. And... Okay, let's go back over here and look at our MSCG again. I'm going to bring that up. I'm going to make this look like the analog curve a bit, because I like that shape. And I'm going to bring the sustain level down to zero. Make the release a bit longer. Now, the other cool thing about this is you can add extra points. So if you want a really funky envelope shape, for some reason, probably not because your goal is a uh, natural sound. You can do that. You can. We have another double pluck here. Um, so you can do that too if you wanted to. That would be for like advanced experimental sounds. So this is the one you would want to use if you are. Um, if you're very carefully trying to model a real-world instrument, and you want to be very precise about the lengths and the curvature of things, then this one would be the way to go. But for most cases, I think the filter and the amp EG will work just fine. Now down here in your modulations, you do have the filter EG and the amp EG that you can use as modulation sources if you want to modulate something else with them, like say the timbre, your wave shape here, your width, anything else besides filter and amp. Those are still available to you. And it makes sense a lot of the time to use the same envelope for multiple things. Okay, so let's come back over here to our filter and amp envelopes. And let's take a look at our four stages, the attack, decay, sustain, and release. So starting with attack, most of the time in an MPE sound, we will want a pretty short attack. And you can see it's showing me the time here. This is a, I don't know if it's exactly exponential, but this is an exponential-ish slider. All this down here, this area is still pretty short attack time. So 50 milliseconds is about here. A longer attack time is usually used for things like ambient pads or simulating an orchestra that's slowly swelling in some strings, something like that. Um, in an MPE sound, you might use it if you were doing something where you really wanted to be partially MPE. So if you were doing a Blade Runner style score and you wanted to have it, sound like a synth rather than an acoustic instrument, 
but you still wanted control over the pitch and things. And you wanted an even fade in for your amp and your filter. So you could do that, but most of the time you're going to want a short attack on these so that you'll be able to play. I know if someone handed me a, a sound with a very slow attack, it'd be all, why the hell can't I hear myself? How long do I have to wait before I have enough volume to do anything with the sound? So usually in MPE, these are going to be pretty short. And I'm turning the sustain back down too because I just turned that up to demonstrate that. And definitely for a plucked sound, the attack is going to be short. Sometimes with an attack of zero, you will hear a little click as you start the note. It's because the sound is suddenly jumping from zero to full volume, and that generates harmonics when you get that little spike. Sometimes you don't get it, and I don't understand why really, but if there's a click and it's annoying, you turn up the attack a little bit. Uh, most of the time for like a guitar, the guitar is not going to ma start making sound until you have plucked the string. So you really want this to be as short as possible. And now if you think about if you wanted a piano, the string is being struck by a hammer that's covered in felt. That's going to be a softer attack. I'm going to turn my decays up so that we can hear things better. So keep it short, but play around with it. Until it matches the kind of sound you want. This is being buzzier than I want, so I'm going to turn down my velocity modulation on this. So yeah, you want your attack to be short enough that you can think of it in terms of hard or soft rather than fast or slow. It should always be fast, these plucks. And a piano around here is softer than a guitar around here. Now we're still going to keep sustain out of things for now. So let's leave that at zero. But we need to talk about decay and release together. Because they're both doing the same thing, they're just doing it at different points. So if you have a guitar and you pluck an open string, that string is just going to continue sounding until it decays to silence. So we can ignore decay. But what does it mean to ignore decay? If we turn this down to zero, then the sound is going to drop to zero instantly when you play it. And you'll hear nothing. So to ignore the decay, in this case, is going to mean that the decay has about half the length of the release. So now what we have is the equivalent of an AR envelope, where it's just attack and release. And it doesn't really matter how long you hold down the note. And this is a useful configuration if you're doing something like a harp or a drum. Something where you smack it and then you're done and you just wait for it to stop. Um, if you're doing this, you also want to have 
make sure that your release and decay envelopes have about the same curvature. See there, I found a use for these digital stages. I'm going to stay in analog now because I like it better. So that's the AR envelope. That's what you would use for drums, for harps and whatnot. Or open strings on the guitar. But if you're fretting your guitar string, it's going to be different. Because what's going to happen is it's going to continue to decay as long as you're holding the fret down. And then it's going to pretty much immediately stop as you lift your finger up because that will have the effect of muting the string. So for a fretted guitar string, we would have a shape more like this. So what do we do if we want a guitar where we can play both open and fretted strings? That's going to take us on a tangent. We'll come back to that. We'll do that before the video is over. So a piano is going to be the same as a guitar. When you play a note and hold it down, it's going to continue sounding until you lift your finger, at which point the mutes move back into place and it will shut off the sound. Unless you're stepping on the sustain pedal, in which case your release will go way up. So these are the sorts of things you need to consider when you're designing your sound. Your settings here are going to depend on what, on what you're going for, really. Shorter decay is going to give you this kind of thing. <laughs> That's very short. I don't really like it that short for MPE because you can't hear the bending that I'm doing. But yeah, that's what these two things are. Decay is for when you're holding the note. Release is for when you let it go. Now, if I want to get more volume out of this thing overall so that you can hear more of those bends, I can bring up the oscillator in the mixer. Bringing up the decay will also give you more volume for hearing. And it's just the way things go that if you want to sound with a really short attack, you're not going to be able to hear much of your bending. Although, you will definitely hear any out of tuneness you're playing with. So if you're like me and you like to play with pitch quantization turned off, you might want to turn it on for these plucked sounds because a fretted instrument is going to be in tune when you strike it. And if you're not quantized and you're missing the exact note, the only part of the sound that you hear is going to be the bad part. And by the time you do your micro corrections to get back in tune, you're going to be inaudible. I guess it doesn't sound too terrible right now.
But if you're playing it in the context of a mix, it's going to clash with everything else. So consider turning that pitch quantize back on if you're doing really short sounds or plucked sounds in general. It, on the other hand, if, you're, if your model is something like an oud or some other fretless, fretless plucked instrument, then, then you should probably leave the pitch quantization off and just play better. So if we turned our decay up, then we've got our pitch back for our MPE. We have our timbre, our Y axis is modulating our pulse width. Let me uh, turn this width to down a bit more and modulate it up a bit more so we can hear more of the effect. But what about our pressure? We have this whole axis that we're not using anymore because we're using velocity to control the volume of the sound. Well, most of the time I just kind of stop pretending that I'm an acoustic instrument and I let myself have some sustain and I will modulate that sustain with the pressure curve. It is, of course, perfectly acceptable not to use pressure in a particular sound. We have it, so let's see what we can do with it. I was trying to think of a non-synthesizer instrument that does this. And I couldn't, but now I just remembered there's a Moog guitar that has some kind of contraption within it that will magnetically resonate your string forever. So we can sound a bit like a Moog guitar. Just amplify this, uh, modulate the sustain all the way up with the pressure. We probably want to do that to some degree with the filter curve too. Maybe not as much, maybe only up that high. So that would probably be your first option for what to do with pressure. I'm going to remove that now. What else would we do with pressure? Let's pretend for a second that we're going to be really insistent on modeling an acoustic guitar. And what happens when you press down on the string on an acoustic guitar? Well, the pitch goes up a little bit and then you get stopped by the fretboard. But you can also bend the string, which is also pressure. It's just sideways pressure. So if we were to take pressure curve and modulate our pitch, say three semitones, it's going to be really unhelpful, isn't it? So let's edit our pressure curve a little bit. Add a point here and have this not kick in until we're giving it a fair amount of pressure. this up a bit more. Let's flatten this. So 
give ourselves five semitones so we can do some David Gilmore bends. Of course, you have to know how to play like David Gilmore to do that. So in theory, this is a good solution to that problem of what we do with our pressure. But um, in practice, I don't really like playing like this. It's just very different from how I normally play, you know, every other instrument. I have two ways of modulating pitch now. This one can give me a wider vibrato. But it is difficult to control. It also only bends up, which is fair enough. That's what an acoustic instrument would do. That's what a guitar will do. You can't bend down on the guitar unless you have a whammy bar. So because I don't like this, I'm going to remove that modulation and look at a special trick. So I'm going to go over to this macro here and right click on it, assign to MIDI CC 18, general purpose controller. Now on the instrument, we have a low row that does various different things. One of its modes is if you press it, it will send MIDI signals for pressure, y-axis, and x-axis. So on the instrument, this is the low row option, xyz equals cc 16 through 18. And 18 is the z. So once I've assigned that, I can use this macro to modulate the pitch. And now... Uh, I can still only bend up. So that's a fun thing to do. I don't know if you can do it on a Rolly Seaboard. I was looking that up and it looks like they have an XY pad that you could use to do this, but that's, I would rather use Z. And I don't understand why it's not an XYZ pad. Um, but this would also be a fun use for a touche or any other auxiliary controller you might have. So yeah, there are lots of things you can still do with pressure. But most of the time, I would probably just either leave it off, add a modulation to sustain. So now I'm going to go back to that case of what if we wanted an open string and a fretted string, both on the same instrument. Well, we need to know, we need to tell the synthesizer how that note is ending whether it should just keep going or whether it needs to stop when I lift my finger. And one thing we might use to do this is our modulator release velocity. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn down my release in both envelopes. And I'm just going to turn that way, way up with release velocity. I think Rolly calls this lift. So that's when you lift your finger off the key. 
how fast you lift your finger off the key will now tell us how much release we want. And so after playing with these ideas for a while, I came up with this sound that will be in your zip file, thought form bender. I just find that sound really fun to play, and it's um. One of my goals for all of these videos is to make sounds that are fun to play, because if they're fun to play, you're going to practice and you're going to get better. You will have more joy in your life. Oh, there's one more thing I wanted to show you. If you're using one of these envelopes down here, say in place of the amp EG, set this up really quick. Lost the one I had earlier because I loaded my bender sound. Something like that. Uh, rename this envelope three. Okay, what you're going to want to do here is set the amp EG to be neutral, as neutral as we can make it. So we turn the attack all the way down, turn the sustain all the way up. When the sustain is up, the decay doesn't matter. And the release we want to be long enough to capture the release of this thing, which looks like looks like about a second and a half. So we can go over to our mixer now, uh, remove this velocity curve, and instead we're going to use the velocity curve to modulate this amplitude of this envelope. So right click here, add modulation from voice LFO three or four velocity curve, uh, ninety nine percent. So we go over to the back over to the mixer. Let's see, put this down here and go over to envelope three and add modulation to the mixer. And now it will be envelope three that is controlling my volume rather than the amp EG, which is just letting it all pass through. So if you want to use your really cool curve shaping ability within the MSEG to model your plucks and your envelopes. That's how you do it. Okay, that does it for part one of the plucks. Because we've gone over all these envelopes, but Surge also lets you do a bunch of other things that will generate plucks and barely use these envelopes at all. Um, I'm talking about physical modeling and that's going to be the subject of the next video. I hope to see you again. Thanks for watching.